everything old is new again. America's entertainment pop culture talk show. It may well possess a rudimentary intelligence. I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. Well, the great disturbance in the force. Hello, I'm Mr. Ray. Come on, Mark, like a job for me. Meet me. Where's the goodies? Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. I bet you wouldn't have done anything like this if Mom and Dad were here. You filthy criminal. Excuse me while I whip this out. Go ahead. Make my day. Here are your hosts, Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Death, eternal punishment for anyone who opens this casket. The mummy, is it dead or alive? Human or inhuman? You'll know, you'll see, you'll feel the awful, creeping, crawling terror that stands your hair on end and brings a scream to your lips. There's nothing on earth like the mummy. Or Everything Old is New Again, and we're back here on Everything Old is New Again, having a great time. That's a clip from The Mummy Bars, call off 1932. Ten years after Howard Carter discovered the tomb of uh, King Tut, it seems that there's been an unending interest in all things ancient Egypt in one form or another since uh, the Greek historian Herodotus, uh, if I pronounced that right, visited uh, and wrote uh, in 500 B.C. to Napoleon visiting in 1798 to Howard Carter discovering King Tut's tomb 1922 and hollywood's fascination with mummies ever since uh, this week we continue our fascinating trip back in time to the days of ancient egypt with professor bob Breyer. dr Breyer has authored quite a number of books on the subject has been teaching the subject at liu post since 1972 performed his own mummification on a cadaver using ancient techniques the only one to do this in 2000 years co-author of the secret of the great pyramids where he proposed a solution to the question of how the pyramids were built. We'll get into that. Wrote a fascinating theory on how did T- King Tut actually die uh, and why. Uh, we'll get into that. Uh, he has three terrific courses on the history of ancient Egypt, another on the great pharaohs, and the latest, decoding hieroglyphs for the teaching company. And you can get those at thegreatcourses.com, thegreatcourses.com. And his latest book is Cleopatra's Needles. I warn you, once you dive into any of these words, works. You will not stop until you've consumed them all. Welcome to Everything Old is New Again. Welcome back, I should say, Dr. Breyer. Thanks, Doug. It's good to be here. It's great to have you. Uh, I, I keep playing every so often these uh, little touches of Hollywood. And ho- I love them. <laughs> and I, I love wonder- them. I was going to say, I hope they're not insulting, because they're not, none of them are really too uh, accurate, are they, with respect to the re, their representation? Let's just focus on mummies for a moment, right? Yeah, no, no, I love this stuff, though. I, I actually did a book called Egyptomania, which is about everybody's fascination with Egypt, and I have a whole chapter on mummy movies. You know, I love the mummy movies. It, it does at least pique our interest, in, and we can have some fun with it, but let's let's go back a little bit, and, and we all kind of look at the mummies and think of mummies and, and at Halloween and all this all this business, but... What exactly is a mummy, and why did they do it? Yeah, well, a, a mummy is, is anything that's preserved with soft tissue. So in other words, a skeleton is a skeleton. If you have only bones, it's not a mummy. But if the bones have some soft tissue left on it that's preserved, then it's a mummy. And, and you know, there were animal mummies, human mummies. Even, I mean, technically, you, you know when you get a box of cereal and you have these dehydrated blueberries in it? Right. Well, that's a mummy of a blueberry. Because it's, 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 it's preserved tissue, soft tissue. It's really a mummy. Well, like beef jerky, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, now, why, I mean, this goes into, I think of the, I think we're going to get into a little bit of their religion, per, religious yes. purposes, but yes. why would they do it? And I think rich people mm-hmm. had, would, had mummification, they did some animals, but for the most part, the things that we're familiar with would be the mummification of the pharaohs, right? Yeah, well, actually, every Egyptian ultimately wanted to be mummified. Right. And the reason they wanted to be mummified is their religion, like you suggest, Douglas. They were resurrectionists. They didn't believe in reincarnation, that you're coming back as something else or anything like that. They believed that your body would literally resurrect, it would get up and go again in the next world. And for that reason, you had to preserve the body so that it would be intact in the next world so you could continue living. So that's why they mummified, to make sure that body would be ready for the next world. Now, they didn't ever go, this is kind of a silly question, I'll just off the top of my head, they, they, they didn't then go back, let's say, uh, I mean, this civilization lasted like 3,000, wait a minute now, 5,000, how many years, 4,000 well, years? Well, it lasted, I mean, well, 
uh, written, the written record goes for 3,000 years, but it goes back thousands of years even earlier. Yeah, right, so yeah. did Egyptians themselves go back and become Egyptologists, if you will, and go into the tombs and open the, the oh, pharaohs? They, they wouldn't go into the tombs, because the idea was you weren't supposed to disturb a tomb of the deceased. But they did have archaeologists. There was a son of Ramses the Great, whose name was Chaim Wasit, and he felt, now understand, this will give you an idea of how long Egyptian civilization lasted. By the time of Ramses the Great, the pyramids of Egypt were ancient monuments. They were a thousand years old. Right. And they were starting to decay. And there, there were, there were some, some places that were crumbling. So Chaim Wasit went around, and he was afraid the names of the pharaohs would be lost who built the pyramids. So he recarved their names on the outsides of their pyramids. So there was an archaeologist in ancient Egypt, you know, who was an ancient Egyptian. Wow, yeah. that's interesting, and that's just maybe the subject of yet another work. Uh, <laughs> plant an idea there, uh, yeah. but the the then the thought is with respect to uh, mummification, you did it uh, yeah. yourself, yeah. and you're the only one in two thousand years to do it. Who was the last one before you, if you know? Was it Cleopatra or somebody like that? Well, it's got to be. An, it's got to be some, somebody during the Roman period. Some of the Romans wanted to be mummified, but we don't right. know who it was actually. Yeah. And then, and, how did you learn the techniques and 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 yeah. do it? Well, you know, this is one of those things, don't try this at home, kids. Right. Uh, but, um, one of, the, of course, there were several sources open to me. The Egyptians never wrote down how they mummified a human. It was a trade secret. Mm. So we don't have any, that's one of the few things they didn't write down. But what we did have were ancient Egyptian mummies. And I've seen plenty of ancient Egyptian mummies. So by studying mummies, you can get the basics. I could, for example, x-ray a mummy, which we often do, or now we can CAT scan them. Um, so you can see what's inside. And then we learn that, oh, they took out the internal organs. You know, they removed the internal organs from a small incision on the left side of the, of the, of the abdomen. Um, so we know they took out the organs. They, they removed the brain through the nose. We know that by x-ray. So by looking at mummies, I could figure out quite a bit, but not everything. I mean, like, how do you remove the brain through the nose? You know, right. things like that. So I was studying mummies themselves. Um, and at some point I realized, you know, we really don't know the details of how they did it. I think the only way to do it is to mummify a human cadaver in the ancient Egyptian way. So it was a scientific experiment to see how the Egyptians did it by doing it. And you did it what year, about 20 years ago? Yeah, I think I did it in 1990 or something like that. Yeah, right. more. And, yeah. And, and have you revisited the mummy since, or yeah. is it... Yeah. Well, yes, yes. We, 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 we take samples, tissue samples. We, we check on our mummy all the time to see if it's decaying. And it looks pretty good, actually. You know, we, we look for fungi inside the body. We have endoscopes. We go in with little tools. They're very, very non-invasive. And we look for fungi. We look for bacterial infections. We look for all kinds of things. And it looks like our mummy is really just like an ancient Egyptian mummy. It seems to be well-preserved. Wow. We, we, we wrap them in linen. We, you know, I had to do all kinds of wacky things to get the materials. For example, the Egyptians dehydrated the body. And the, the key to mummification is really to dry it out. Right. That's why those blueberries in your, in your cereal stay forever, because bacteria need moisture to work on, to, to break down tissue. And if there's no moisture, bacteria can't attack it. So they wanted to dehydrate the body. So they, after they removed the organs, now the organs are very moist. You know, your stomach has all that moisture in it, your liver, your spleen is basically a bag with blood in it. Um, so you've got to get rid of all those organs. So they took out the organs first, and they're going to keep them. They're not going to throw it away. You want to be complete in the next world. They took out the organs. They took out the brain. And then they dehydrated the body by putting it in a salt called natron, N-A-T-R-O-N, which occurs naturally in Egypt. It's a mixture, really, of, of regular table salt and baking soda. It occurs naturally in Egypt. And they would take hundreds of pounds of this and put it over the mummy and leave it for 70 days. And after 70 days, you've basically got yourself a mummy. And when you're looking at the mummy, you're looking at the actual real skin and bones of that person, right? Exactly. exactly. Interesting. Yeah. We'll be back uh, and everything old is new again right after this and, uh, and continue our discussion with Dr. Bob Breyer. Take a look at the courses that, gr uh, that he's teaching at thegreatcourses.com. Cleopatra's Needle uh, goes on and on. Go to Amazon. Dr. Breyer, B-R-I-E-R. -E look it up. Where will we find the mummy? Don't worry. <laughs> the mummy will find you. You'll howl as you follow Bud and Lou in a strange land where exotic dancers perform ancient rituals. 
You'll scream at this mystic world of mad magic. You're listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. You have come tonight to the most fabulous and celebrated place in the world. Here on the plateau of Gizeh stands forever the mightiest of human achievements. No traveler, emperor, merchant, or poet has trodden on these sands and not gasped in awe. There we go. We're gasping in awe at uh, the knowledge and information and fun we're having with Dr. Breyer on Everything Old is New Again, talking all things ancient Egypt. We left off a little bit there about uh, uh, mummies. And before we get into talking about pyramids, that's a little clip there, by the way, of, of uh, Roger Moore's uh, James Bond, uh, the, the spy who loved me in Egypt there. Uh, if you remember that scene, that's a little trivia. But anyway, uh, Doctor, talk to us a little bit more about uh, the mummification. We didn't finish that off. Yeah, well, one thing we, we should mention is they've removed, as every sixth grader can tell you, <laughs> they've, removed, they've removed the brain through the nose. Now, it's a curious thing, because the Egyptians wanted to be complete in the next world, so they kept everything. They kept the internal organs that they removed, they dehydrated them, and they put them in special jars, so that when you buried the mummy in the tomb, he'd have his jars next to him, and by magic, it would all come together in the next world, and he'd resurrect. The only thing they left inside the body was the heart because they believed that you thought with your heart not your brain now that makes some sense by the way it's not crazy because think about it when you get excited it's your heart that beats quickly not your brain right you know and we even have a holdover from that belief because on valentine's day don't we send little chocolate hearts right we really should be sending little chocolate brains <laughs> and they put them in, it's a fancy name, right, canoptic, is that what it is, canopic, jars? Canoptic jars, canopic. yes, to keep them. But they threw out the brain. Now, why did they throw out the brain? They didn't know its purpose. They didn't think it had a real function. It was almost like a filler. They thought, since you thought with your heart, you didn't need your brain, so they threw out the brain. Uh, so that was the only thing they threw away, ironically. So I think there'll be a lot of dumb Egyptians wandering around in the next world. That's right. Yeah. Uh, that's the, the next the world full of zombie Egyptians. It's another exactly, movie exactly. for Hollywood to develop. Um, yeah. Let's ta- turn a little bit of our attention then to The Secret of the Great Pyramid, a book that you, uh, I guess you'd say, co-wrote with Jean-Pierre yeah. Houdin in yeah. 2008. I know he came to you. He was a, a novice to this, right? He was an engineer, came to Egyptology, if you will, or the history of and the question of pyramids from a different angle and seem to have come up with what seems to be the solution that everyone, when I was growing up, no one knew how were these pyramids built. And this some idea that he presents and you present in this book. Maybe you could explore that with us. Sure. Um, it, it, Jean-Pierre Houdin is actually an architect, a French architect, uh, yes. um, who contacted me and said, he has a theory about how the pyramids were built that he'd like to talk to me about. Uh, you know, we get, you know, Egyptologists get, get people like that all the time. They're usually retired engineers, and they usually don't know what they're talking about. So it's not very profitable. But a friend of mine said, talk to this guy. He really knows stuff. So I invited Jean-Pierre to, to my house, my apartment, and, and he came over with his laptop computer and started showing me images that he had created um, models of the pyramid, sort of architectural renderings of the pyramid. And I realized very quickly, this guy knew a lot of stuff. He was really, really good. And I was asking him questions about it, and he always had an answer. He was very, very good. And his theory answers the basic question that we all have about the pyramid. How did they raise the blocks to the top? Right. Now, in the movies, you know, you, you've been playing clips from various Egypt, Egypt, Hollywood movies about Egypt. And in the movies, it always shows a ramp. And you have all these slaves hauling blocks up a ramp, getting them to the top of the pyramid. First, the Egyptians did not use slaves for building their pyramids. They used free labor. These were construction workers who were paid. They were given food. They were housed. They were well taken care of. So the pyramids are built by Egyptians for the pharaoh. Now, the problem of getting the block up to the top is a really interesting one. Because... You know how when you walk up a hill, if it's really steep, you're huffing and puffing? Right. There's, there's a limit to what, you can, what the angle can be for a ramp. To haul a block up a ramp, the ramp can't be more than, say, 8% grade. Right? Mm. Only a very gentle slope. Now, if the pyramid is 440 feet high, that's what it is, 440 feet high, 
and it can't have more than an 8% slope, it can't be too steep, that ramp is going to have to be a mile long. Hmm. Now, to build a ramp a mile long, going up to the top of the pyramid, is as much blocks as the pyramid itself. Right. And we've never found any remains of such a ramp. So how did they get it up? You couldn't have done it with a ramp. They couldn't have done it with a ramp. So Jean-Pierre, at least with a single ramp outside the, the pyramid, so Jean-Pierre came up with a new theory. And his theory was that they did it with a ramp, all right, but it's inside the pyramid, and it's corkscrewing. You know how when you go into a garage, and, and, and into a garage, you, you're going around and around and around? Right. And that's, that's basically what's inside the pyramid, a ramp going around and around and around inside. And they brought the blocks up inside the pyramid all the way to the top. And now, John Pierre's theory is that inside that pyramid remains this mile-long ramp hollow inside the Great Pyramid. So that's what the book's about, this theory and our search in Egypt to try to find evidence of ramps like this. Now, uh, am I wrong? Uh, I thought they, they recently did some kind of, uh, I use not the right words, but the x-ray or something yes, yes, of the pyramid and saw evidence of this, no? Yes, yes. There was one of the things, one of the reasons I really believed in Jean-Pierre was is it, is it a remarkable thing. So we, we came out with this theory about the internal ramp, you know, that it's really Jean-Pierre's theory, and I'm just trying to help him. You know, I'll tell you a funny thing about Jean-Pierre. I mean, he became obsessed with this, with this theory of his. He, he was a successful architect. He quit his job, and, and for three years he did nothing but stay inside with his computer, doing his computer simulations of the, of the Great Pyramid, how it was built, this and that. And he never and he visited was, the pyramid. You, you no, that, that's right. That. I mean, yeah. yeah. You know, I, 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 so I said to him when he was showing me <laughs> all these things, and he knew so much about the pyramid, I said, well, what did you think of the pyramid when you saw it for the first time? And he said, oh, I've never been there. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, I, you know, for him, it wasn't a monument to be visited. It was more a problem to be solved. Right. So anyway, we, we wrote this, you know, we... So I figured he needs help. I've got to figure out if this guy's right or not. But he was giving a lecture in Paris about his theory. And at the end of the lecture, a guy came up to him and said, you know, if you come to my office next week, I will show you something that will make you very happy because I was a member of a team that did, in a sense, an X-ray of the pyramid several years ago. So, but, but these guys never found the ramp, right? They never said anything about it. So Jean-Pierre goes the next week. He goes over to this guy's office, and he prints out for him a picture that his computer had printed out years earlier, and it looks like our internal ramp. Huh. And Jean-Pierre says, well, why didn't you publish this? Why didn't you say something about it? The guy said, you know, we, we got this thing printed out, but it didn't make any sense to us. So we never thought it was significant. Nobody wow. ever thought there would be an internal ramp in there. So there is some evidence for the ramp. We haven't proven it, but it looks like they may have gotten it up with an internal ramp. Now, how are these pyramids doing now? I keep hearing stories about the deterioration uh, of their yeah. uh, you know, the structure. Yeah, basically the pyramids are solid. I mean, if they, you know, basically a pyramid is, is, is solid. There's not a lot of chambers inside. They were intended for the burial of a pharaoh, you know, one pharaoh. And it's so high up in the pyramid is maybe a burial chamber with some passages to get to it. But that's basically it. So they're pretty solid. They, you know, they're made up, like take the Great Pyramid of Giza, the big one. Um, that ha- that's made up of two, two million blocks of stone. Mm. And they average about five, you know, two and a half tons each. So they, that, that part is stable. What's not stable is the outside of the pyramid was faced with beautiful white limestone. And that's what's crumbling. And, and, and when you go to see the Great Pyramid, you don't see the white limestone anymore. It's gone. It's gone. So some of the pyramids, their white limestone is gone. You can still see it in a few of the pyramids, which is, which is pretty impressive. But in general, I think the pyramids are going to last another 40 centuries. And, and when, when you, that's long enough for us, right? When, yes. when, when you actually go into the pyramid, yes. there's a, a, ba- this is a couple of passages, but there's a basically one big room, I guess you could say, with all the hieroglyphs on it of the history of that, uh, that pharaoh. Is that, is that wrong or is it close? Well, you're, 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 you're partly right. Um, now, in the Great Pyramid, if you go into the Great Pyramid of Giza, which was built by the Pharaoh Khufu, you will not find a single hieroglyph, mm. not one. There was no writing inside this pyramid, none on the outside as far as we know. Um, it was simply kind of simply built and stark. Um, so this, this was one pyramid. We didn't, weren't sure who the Pharaoh was until we found other, other monuments. Um, but there are later pyramids which are covered with hieroglyphs inside, beautiful hieroglyphs. Um, and these are called the pyramid texts because they're inside pyramids. And what these are, are these are all magical spells. 
so that the Pharaoh will resurrect in the next world. So there's, there's a couple hundred of these spells on the wall, and each one has a different purpose. So, for example, one is to protect the Pharaoh while the mummy is inside his burial chamber. And it says, Unus rests in his burial chamber. No scorpion bites the mummy of Unus. And then there's later spells that say, Unus resurrects to the next world. Unus is met by the gods. Horus is on his right side. Osiris is on his left. So later pyramids have all these spells to help the Pharaoh resurrect in the next world. Well, and that's really interesting, the, the religion that they, uh, uh, the, they, they professed uh, for years and years and years. Oh, yes. Thousands of years that. they believed in the resurrection. Amazing. Um, yeah. If you want to look at some of that uh, information on the uh, Great Pyramid, the secret of the Great Pyramid uh, with Dr. Breyer and, and so much uh, other uh, information, uh, you just start off with thegreatcourses.com and, and you'll be hooked, believe me. On Everything Old is New Again, we'll be right back and dive into some of the pharaohs, see what they're all about. Everything Old is New Again. Now, back to America's Entertainment Pop Culture Talk Show. Everything old is new again with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Welcome back to Everything Old is New Again. I certainly am happy listening to the Beatles there introduce uh, our next session here with uh, Dr. Breyer. We're talking about, of course, ancient Egypt and doing so for a while, having some fun. Uh, let's turn our attention, if we can, a little bit to the pharaohs. And how do I pronounce, am I pronouncing that wrong? Uh, that name is trouble for me. I don't know why. Pharaoh? No, you're right. You're right. All right, Pharaoh. And, uh, and if you look at um, very uh, briefly, some of our, our experience with this is just from the Ten Commandments or the movies that we see. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I just could you give us an idea how? I mean, the the Pharaoh is not a president. The Pharaoh is more or less yeah. a dictator and a god on earth, right? How did that develop? And and how did the Egyptian people feel about uh, their Pharaoh? Uh, if he was good or bad, indifferent? Did they still think he was a god? Where do we go with that? Well, you're right, certainly, that the pharaohs were gods on earth. Um, they weren't ordinary guys. They, they had absolute power. Um, and it was believed that they really were gods. So they were worshipped as such. Um, now, one of, the, one of the things I think, you know, in, in, in the very early, we, we were talking about how Egypt has so much going for it. You know, it's got art, it's got monuments, it's got hieroglyphs, it's got mummies. But it's also got personalities. We know about the pharaohs of Egypt. You know, we can, I, can, I can name 150 pharaohs for you. Wow. Um, I won't, don't worry. <laughs> um, but, but we have personalities. For example, one of my favorite pharaohs is Sneferu, a guy named Snefer that nobody knows about. But he's the one who really showed Egypt how to build pyramids. He's the one who developed the pyramid, you know, and, and it didn't go right. You know, he, he had a pyramid collapse on him. There was a pyramid that they were building that collapsed while it was being built, so they had to abandon it in the desert. Then they started on another pyramid, had another problem with that one. And finally, he built a third pyramid, which was perfect, and he was buried in it. So, you know, everybody likes to think of the Egyptians as perfect pyramid builders in this, but they weren't. They had disasters. And Sneferu was the guy who persevered, and he did it, you know. And he was revered by Egyptians, and a thousand years after he was dead, the Egyptians used to say, when they did something good, not since the time of Sneferu has its like been done. <laughs> you know, so, so Sneferu is a pharaoh that, that the ancient Egyptians revered. So about, did the Egyptians like their pharaohs? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Sneferu was a winner. They loved him. But now, what if, I mean, it's just yeah. an odd thing. If they're supposed to be, or, you know, they, they believe them to be God on earth, and they don't like them or what they're doing, mm -hmm. uh, what was the mood, if you, if you even know, of, of the people yeah. then when they're uh, subjugated to someone that, that's a God that they're not really uh, attuned to? Yeah. Now, now, first of all, remember that we don't, you know, we're used to sort of having access to the Pharaoh and knowing what he does and what mm -hmm. he's like, right? We all see Trump. Right, we see him on TV every night. Right. We know everything he does. Um, but the, the Egyptians didn't have much com you know, contact. I mean, the average Egyptian never would have seen his pharaoh. For example, if you lived in the south and the pharaoh lived in the north, you're never going to see him. Right. So, so they didn't really have that much give and take. Um, but, so he was a distant figure, certainly. But there was one pharaoh that we do know that people didn't like. 
Akhenaten. Was Akhenaten. Yes, you got it. <laughs> ah, you took the course. You were paying attention sure when did. I did those lectures, right? That, that Akhenaten lecture. I had to prove my words here. Good man, it? good man. You'll get a B at least. <laughs> um, Akhenaten was the pharaoh, as you know, because you're a good student, Douglas. <laughs> uh, as you know, Akhenaten changed the religion. He, he came in. Now, the Egyptians, of course, were polytheists. They believed in many gods. You had Horus, the falcon god. You had serpent gods. You had Anubis, the god of mummification. Um, they had hundreds, literally hundreds of gods. And Akhenaten comes in and says there is only one god, the solar disk, the sun. And he closes down all the temples. He says there is no god besides the Aten, the hmm. solar disk. So all the temples are closed. Now the people hate this. They've been worshiping these gods. You know, you, know, you can imagine the little old lady who's been worshiping her god forever, right. you know, and now Akhenaten comes in and says, no, no, you're wrong, there's no, there's no god. It's not going to happen. So he was so unpopular, this pharaoh Akhenaten, that he actually had to move out of town. He, he decided to build his own capital in the desert where no one lived. And he took about 30,000 followers with him, the faithful who were this new religion, you know, think of it as like the early days of Christianity and Christ, when you get these followers and people are following this new exciting religion. So they moved into the desert, built a city called Achet Aten, which is the horizon of the Aten, and he, he, he lived there for about, oh, I guess maybe 17 years, and then he died. Um, and then they went back to the old religion. But he was a pharaoh that people didn't like, and he had to a, had a move out of town and live in isolation, pretty much. And from what I understand, part of the problem uh, with his religion, if I'm, I don't get into too much detail, but uh, was that he didn't address the hereafter, no? That's right. I mean, you know, people up until the time of Akhenaten believed in resurrection. They were going to get up and go again in the next world. But if there is no next world, if there are no gods of the next world, what's going to happen? So I think he also took away the, the, the hope for immortality for the people. Nobody really knew what to believe. So right. He was very, very unhappy. You know, not, I presume not, no not, mummifications during that time either then, no? Or that, the people that, probably did it themselves, I some guess. Some of the people may have done it, we, but but you're right. During the Samarna period, we just don't know. No. Now, he uh, then passed away after 17 years, yes. and I, uh, they're not exact about this when, when I researched this, but yes. it seems to be that he's the dad of King Tut, and the, uh, let's say yes. the stepmom would be Queen Nefertiti, who's a name that we know yes. from the movies and so forth. Am I on the mark? there a little bit, or yeah, are we way doing, off? No, no, you're doing well. You're moving up to a B-plus from UP. This is pretty <laughs> okay. good. Um, no, you're right. Tutankhamun is the son of Akhenaten. And when Akhenaten dies, you know, you've got little Tut, who's about 10 years old, and he becomes king of Egypt. Now, we know him as Tutankhamun, but that wasn't his given name. His name was Tutankhaten. Hmm. Now, remember, the Aten is the solar disk, and the name Tutankhaten means the image of the Aten lives. And so he's born Tutankhaten, but when the father dies, the decision is made, let's get rid of this new religion, let's go back to the old religion. So they rename him, Little Tut, he becomes Tutankhamun, named after the god Amun, and they move back to Thebes, to Luxor, to, to the main cities in Egypt, and he starts polytheism again, and everybody's happy. Again. Right, but so, he's nine years old when he begins, yeah. so it's sort of someone else was in there uh, scheming and conniving, we think, right? And, and doing these things uh, possibly with his, uh, with the, just getting a stamp of approval by the nine year old. But it, that's touched upon in The, the Murder of Tutankhamun, which is uh, a book that you, you wrote, uh, which touches upon, we don't have too much time, but touches upon the idea that it's possible King Tut was murdered uh, for, let's say, political reasons, no? Yes, that, that's right. Um, there, there, we do have the mummy of, of Tutankhamun, uh, and when I looked at the x-rays, and other people looked at the x-rays, it looks like he may have died of a blow to the back of the head. So he, it could be that he was murdered. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's a very turbulent time, uh, but the, the, the boy king, I think, could have been murdered. I haven't proven it by any means. As I say in the book, it's a theory, you know, and it, but, but I think it's a good theory, and I think it is a good chance that, that poor Tut was murdered. You know, it's funny, you know, you're playing all these clips from movies of mummies and things like that, but Roland Emmerich, the movie producer, bought the movie rights to the murder of Tut, and maybe someday he'll make the movie. I was going to say, it reads like an historical fiction, uh, and, yeah. and I mean by that in the great, best sense of it, in that you fill in the gaps, you make people come alive, it's told as a story, just about, and uh, it makes it um, a, a, a very, uh, what would you say, it makes it come alive in that you really are there and can believe that what you're saying uh, is possible that it happened. 
Yeah, yeah, it has all those features of a movie. You know, it's got a love element. It's got yeah. it's got murder. It's got mystery. It's got you know all kinds of things going on, and it's all true. Maybe it'll yeah. be the next uh, Titanic. We'll see. Uh, we'll be yeah. back on everything old is new again with Doctor Bob Ryan. This is Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. You're in big trouble, King Tut. Kidnapping, murder, grand theft, and malicious mischief. You had a party, Pope Cleo! Now you see, we've had our first spat. There we go. We're not going to have any spats here on Everything Old is New again with Dr. Breyer talking all things uh, ancient Egypt. And that, of course, is from Batman, the King Tut character who kidnapped Lee Merriweather as a Cleopatra type of character. And we had Lee on the, the show a couple of months ago. So just to bring us all to back to the beginning here. And, and, and so doing, you know, we see and talk. Let's just talk about Hollywood for a moment. Hollywood's yeah. representation, whether it be on television or in the movies, when you see that representation, you see what's being presented. Is there any anything that is close to being uh, true in, in what they present about the Egyptian civilization that comes to mind? Because most of it seems to be off except for maybe the architecture. Well, sometimes it's, sometimes it's, it's pretty good, actually, sometimes. For example, I mean, take the earliest one, that, you know, the Boris Karloff movie, 1932, The Mummy. That has some things that are based on the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. And some of the artifacts that you see there are really artifacts that are sort of replicas of things found in Tutankhamun's tomb. And at the very last scene in that, in that, in that film, um, where they're, they're speaking ancient Egyptian, supposedly, they actually are speaking ancient Egyptian. Somebody got it right for them, and Boris Karloff is saying, Neb, Hetep, Neb, Hetep, you know, right. Lord God, Lord God. So, so sometimes they get it right. Sometimes okay. They get it right. And how about Cleopatra? I bet you they've got some of that right then, I guess. Yeah, the, the, the Elizabeth Burton... Um, Right. The Elizabeth Taylor Richard Burton one is, is pretty pretty accurate. Um, as a matter of fact, I think the reason it was you know, people forget it was a, it was a fabulous movie, you know, really a big deal. Right. It, it's the only movie ever to be the largest grossing movie of the year and lose money. <laughs> right. it, it, it got so long and so overdone and with its accuracy that they just couldn't you know couldn't afford to do it really and they did it um so that's pretty accurate though they've got they've got almost everything accurate in that movie how about the uh, ten commandments we talk about ramses and the great exodus we have any evidence of, of any of that now that's not a bad movie either you know the charlton heston one's pretty right. good you know um with yul brenner and uh, that's pretty good it's, it's fairly accurate i think um the question do we have any evidence for it is tough you know in one of the curious things is the egyptians only recorded their victories they never recorded defeats. So the Egyptians never recorded the Exodus. You know, if something took place in Egypt, like the Exodus, the Egyptians sure didn't write it down. Right. Um, you know, so there's very little evidence for the actual Exodus. Most of what we have, it comes from the Bible. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, during that time period, we, we see, I think it's Yul Brenner. I haven't seen this movie in a while, but Yul yep. Brenner and uh, Ram, representing Ramses, correct? Ramses the Great. Right. And yes. so this was some pharaoh, this, this character. I mean, maybe give us a little background. He lived for yeah. a long time, a lot of kids, a lot of monuments. What, what, what was he all about? A lot of yeah, wars, that, that, right? Yeah, Ramses was one of the longer reigning monarchs. He ruled for 67 years, right? So he was pharaoh for 67 years. Mm. Lives into his late 80s. We have his mummy, you know, we actually have his mummy, and by looking at the x-rays of his mummy, we can tell that his last few years were horrible, miserable. He had terrible tooth infections. Um, we could have even died from it. He could have died from septicemia, a massive infection um, throughout his system that it couldn't take. So Ramses had a tough old age, but he, but he lived to be well into his mid-80s. Um, so Ramses is Ramses the Great, and he's great for a couple of reasons. One is he lives for 67 years. Um, he built some fabulous temples, fabulous. There's, a, there's one in the south at Abu Simbel, which is carved into a mountain, which has four colossal statues right. of Ramses the Great. They're 65 feet high, and I think our Mount Rushmore is based on them. Okay. You know, so, so Ramses did great things. He built great temples, but he also had 100 kids. Right. Um, you know, he had, he had something like 56 sons and 44 daughters. Um, and he had more than one wife, I might add. So well, who, so followed, so who followed him then? There must have been some little... Was it just first in line, first in time? Yeah, well, what happens, though, is if, if your dad lives into his 80s, now, now he's got all these sons, right? but the first 12 have already died. His, his oldest 12 sons died before Ramsey. So it's the 13th son, a guy named Merampatah, who becomes the pharaoh. 
right? Okay. So it's his 13th son. Now, when you're talking about the monument, I remember seeing either see the outside or inside the monument. When you go into this sort of cave, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. there's four, I think, four figures, three of the gods, that are the usual gods of the Egyptians, and Ramses himself, right? He put himself right in there next to Very them? Very good. Yes, no, you're, you're absolutely right. As, as you, when you go into the Holy of Holies, the most sacred room in the temple, you go all the way into the back, there's three gods, you know, you got Ptah, Amun, you know, Horus, and you've got Ramses the Great sitting there with his boys. So he's elevated himself to the level of the gods, and he's the same size as the gods, yeah. Right, so he had some, some ego, and, and so, which yeah. I guess he, he earned in, in that, you know, all that time. He, he, what did he achieve for the civilization? I mean, he, he expanded the, uh, the boundaries a little bit, no? Yes, yes, he, he viewed himself as a warrior pharaoh. He did go into right. battle, right, he did go into battle, um, the, the, the greatest battle he fought is, is called the Battle of Kadesh, which, which you know, he writes on, on all the temples he built. He puts long accounts of the Battle of Kadesh. We have more accounts of that battle than of any other ancient event in history. And, and Ramsey talks most about how he won. He actually didn't. It was a, it was a standoff. It was a draw. They had a truce. Um, but he brags that he won. Uh, but Ramsey was great at boasting. He was very good at PR for himself. Um, and he's, 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 he's the one that everybody remembers. Well, that's know? how you become great. History's written by the, the victors, right? Yes, yes, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> and, and listen, before we go any further, I want to yeah. remind everybody, get on board. Check all of this out in detail. You're going to love it. And it's cost-effective. It's not that expensive. You could get these courses. They're on CDs. They're on MP3s. You can download them right directly to, to the computer, thegreatcourses.com. You're going to be enthralled with this stuff. There's so much more to talk about than we just talked about in the last two shows, not to mention all the books. Just go to Amazon, Bob Breer, B-R-I-E-R, Bob Breyer. Uh, you will see tons of books. None of them is a loser. I have read just about all of them. I haven't gotten to Cleopatra's Needle yet, Cleopatra's Needles, and I really want to get into that. That sounds, from what we've heard already today, uh, like this. Uh, it's a great adventure there as well, uh, or a number of adventures, moving these obelisks and why and so forth. So get into that. One thing I want to talk about, our show is Everything Old is New Again, to me, uh, ancient Egypt is actually the largest topic and the most similar or the most uh, you know close to our theme, which what we try to do is take a look at history, take a look at the past, and realize that the entertainment that we have, we're an entertainment show, but the entertainment we have today is always built upon what there was before. And I don't know how much further back you can get than ancient Egypt, and still to this year, year we had it wasn't that great but we had a, mo a movie with tom cruise one of the biggest stars of our uh nation if you will as starring in an egyptian type of movie so uh, do you believe and see that everything old is new again especially as it relates to uh ancient egypt oh i, I think so and i agree with you by the way it wasn't that great but it was still entertaining <laughs> you know it was an okay movie but yeah you know there, there is this fascination with egypt and we see it all the time. I mean, you know, all those clips that you play are just wonderful, you know, with, from Steve Martin's, you know, born in Arizona, built a condo made of stone, or King Pat. I mean, you know, all of those things show that there's something about Egypt that grabs us. It, it, it's old, but it resonates with us today. You know, even the story of poor King Tut, you know, who may have been murdered, or Cleopatra, for example, the queen, this, this beautiful queen who's struggling valiantly to, to bring Egypt back to greatness. I mean, those are human stories that, that all, you know, sort of ring true to us today so they were people just like us you know they were Right, and, and what they did still resonates, as we talked about, in, uh, in somewhat in religion, certainly in uh, you know, the hereafter, the thoughts about the hereafter. Yes, certainly. everybody wants to live forever, right? I want to live forever, right? I right. Mean, everybody wants to live forever, and the Egyptians really seem like they almost achieved it. You know, I think, I think one of the things about mummies that, that strikes me is that when, when you take a kid to a museum, and if there's a mummy there, he will stand there and look at that mummy for as long as his parents let him. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's almost like, is he really dead? Did he achieve immortality? And I think we all, in a sense, are envious of the Egyptians. 
because it's almost like they pulled it off. It's almost like they're immortal. Right. As long as we remember them, they're not truly, uh, yeah. truly gone. Quote from yeah, Star there, there Trek. Was, there was an ancient Egyptian expression <laughs> to say the name of the dead is to make them live again. There you go. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. that's terrific. That's a great way to end, and we certainly appreciate your time, and thank you uh, so much for spending so much time with us, Dr. Bob Breyer. We had a, a great time talking about all things ancient Egypt. Again, thegreatcourses.com, murder of Tutankhamen. Uh, let's see. Uh, the, uh, I guess we could go through a, a list of books. Just go to Amazon.com, Ancient Egypt, Everyday Life, and, of course, Cleopatra's Needles is the, the latest one on Everything Old is New Again. Thank you again for your time, Doctor. A pleasure, Douglas. We'll be back right after this next week. Talk all things pop culture. Everything old is new again.